The title of my talk is High Resolution Photographic Technology, New Pedagogical Opportunities in Art History. When I was an undergraduate studying art history almost 20 years ago, we used a Kodak carousel slide projector like this one to study works of art. I remember loving the sound they made, the way they hummed in the darkness, the ka that accompanied the turn of the rotary wheel as each slide passed into the light. Accompanied by the sound of the professor's voice in the darkness, there was a certain magic to it. By the time I got to grad school though, all the carousel projectors were gone. Suddenly, we were looking at works like Jackson Pollock's Lavender Mist in PowerPoints with the basic identifying information right there on the slide. This alone was a revelation, but the images still varied widely in terms of color, quality, and resolution. Even today, the resources for finding good digital images for teaching are quite problematic whether it's a mid 20th century abstract canvas or a 13th century altarpiece, one finds tremendous variance in what's available. It might come as a surprise looking at this slide to some that in this case, the JPEG file from the expensive digital repository art store is actually the worst of the three. In recent years, Wikipedia has in fact become one of the best places to find high resolution images of canonical artworks, but details are still often scant or very widely in terms of their quality. And this is especially ironic given that we continually ask our students to look closely, but then aren't able to provide them with the reproductions that would truly foster such scrutiny. Now, in the wake of the crisis brought on by COVID-19, art history professors across the nation have been forced to reassess how they convey the material properties of artworks to students who are now participating in classes almost entirely in their homes and dormitories. Even before the current crisis brought a new urgency to this question, however, I was thinking about how the kinds of images we use in art history affect student learning and something that is more difficult to quantify, something we might call the encouragement of wonder or the creation of a certain kind of enchantment. In my estimation, and I'm not the only one thinking about this, something was lost in our eagerness to adopt the new plethora of web sourced images. Thus, what I want to talk about today is the experience of art history that we are affording our students, whether it's in virtual spaces or in the physical classrooms we'll soon, hopefully, return to. I believe technology affords us a tremendous opportunity to reinscribe that sense of wonder around art I was just mentioning. And that one of the ways we can do this is through high resolution digital photographs of details. For me, close looking and the kind of intense thinking it produces really is everything. Let me begin a little bit further by showing you what I mean. This is a detail photograph I took with a Sony 24 megapixel camera that I bought in 2015, just before embarking on a trip to conduct research for a book that I was just starting to write. It was on this trip that I started learning about the power of details like these. For the photos I took that summer reminded me of things about the artworks that proved a font of inspiration for years to come. I began wondering after that if the same could be true for works of art that I was teaching, something that became even more of a concern when I moved from New York City to accept a job at the University of Louisiana, where I knew I would be far from the masterworks of the traditional Western canon. I wanted to find ways to photograph artworks such that their material vitality and physical scale would be preserved. And my hope was that in so doing, I would be able to recreate the intensity of viewing artworks in person and foster the enchantment that I believe is so naturally present within art's domain. 
For a while, I'll admit that my efforts were rather scattershot. I photographed what I could, when I could, without a system for how I might use the images that I was gathering. But all this changed in 2019, when a grant allowed me for the first time to strategically photograph works of art to enhance the experience of my students. My plan was to visit some of our nation's greatest museums in two major cities, Washington DC and Philadelphia. In the end, I took almost 4,000 photographs over five days, and I've already begun working these images into the classes that I teach. Let me show you some of the results by segueing back to that Pollock painting I began with. If this is what teaching action painting looked like in 2000, and this is what it's looked like in PowerPoint in the years since, then this is where I'm pushing it to maybe go next. Sorry about the dog barking outside. I want to encourage my students to do the kind of slow looking that takes them back to the origin moment of creation itself. By looking closely at just a small section of Pollock's work in this way, one can begin to understand the tension in these paintings between the utter chance that was letting the paint fall where it may and the very willful choices the artist made in terms of how he layered that color, how much he let the hue dry and sink into the canvas and how strategically he worked pigment right up to the edges of the bounding frame. The art historian James Elkins has claimed that, quote, the world is full of things that we do not see. It is almost as if seeing is too full, too powerful to indulge in without careful rules and limitations, end quote. For me, these detail photographs show a new dimension of that statement. They are meant to sharply demarcate where and how my students look from the signature and date that most fail to see in the lower left corner to the great sweeps of color mixing with drizzles laid over the top. Such high resolution photographs chip away at the fullness of the object, breaking it down into visual morsels that reveal the work's spontaneity and process, its physicality and its power. Details like these are not the whole story though. I experimented in the galleries with lots of other kinds of looking, trying in a variety of ways to capture scale. Again, something usually missing in traditional forms of art history teaching. Sometimes I would capture other people while they looked at works, as in this slide, but I found myself increasingly also crouching down low like this, trying to figure out how I could convey the sheer monumentality of all that paint across a canvas that looked in person like a terrain. These sharply raking angles resulted in images I hadn't expected, but that were tremendous in the sense of conveying the push and pull of thick and thin in the drip paintings, and the way they sometimes still look viscous and wet, yet also brittle and dry. And I didn't just do this with mid 20th century abstract pieces. I did it to Cezanne canvases as I tried to understand where he applied paint and where he left the canvas bare. I took this painting and many others like it apart to try to understand what would lead a man to eviscerate a woman's face like this or to gouge out pieces of a man like the sculptor Rodin did here. I hope at this point you might agree with me that there really is a magic in these details. There are ways to photograph works of art such that what, one, what John Berger once called the immediacy of their testimony is brought to the fore. For Berger, if we can find ways to follow the traces of the artist's choices, and sink into the silence and stillness which permeates works of art, then this might have the effect of closing the distance between the making of the work and the act of looking at it. It is exactly this distance that I want to close in the hopes that if we can see the present clearly enough, we shall ask the right questions of the past. For moments of art, even from the distant past, 
are right here with us and technology can make them almost dizzyingly close. So take this Giotto painting that I photographed in the National Gallery. It is over 700 years old and everywhere signs of that age are present in the crackular that has shattered the Virgin's beautiful face, in the bits of paint loss in the halo above Christ's head. But there is also a tremendous sense of nearness which spills out of the work. It's there in the warm touch between a mother and her child, in the tiny ornamental marks tapped into the gold. Sometimes it has been very specifically the signs of the hand of the artist that made me feel a sense of wonder as I looked through the lens of technology. I found myself sometimes overwhelmed by the intensity of the presentness of all that past rushing up to meet me. I had this feeling overwhelmingly looking at this particular Raphael and when I spent the better part of an hour with Van Gogh's 1890 Roses, a painting which unfortunately reproduces much greener than it is in reality. I quickly found myself consumed by Van Gogh's brushwork, by how thickly he builds up paint, but then left the canvas utterly bare right next to it. Something similar happened when I was photographing a Rembrandt self-portrait I think partly what struck me was the realization that these photographs would forever change what I could teach students about this artist. I could now talk about impasto in a totally different way. And I could show them not only details, but raking photographs like these, which I would never be able to find on art store or Wikipedia or anywhere on the web, I imagine. I should mention at this point that there, was, that there has been a recent effort to utilize augmented and virtual reality to enhance viewers' experiences of artworks. I'm showing you screenshots now from an augmented reality app that was developed using 3D scans of actors recreating the scene of the painting. It's not the only one of its kind. In fact, some collectors are making their artworks available to the public exclusively for, through VR, creating digital spaces that function as simulated repositories where one can explore high resolution models of artworks that were created by stitching together thousands of photographs like the ones I took. All of these digital files I accumulated have begun to remind me of the old slide libraries we had to curate in service of the carousel projectors I began this talk with. But my thousands of digital images also have begun to remind me of the tradition of the cabinet of curiosities. These collections, which emerged in the 16th century, intermingled paintings and sculptures with other items deemed marvelous or miraculous. All this made me think about the way art used to be considered contiguous with science, and at the heart of both was wonder. No less a philosopher than Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, believed that wonder was crucial for science. And Francis Bacon believed that the kind of mystified incomprehension that cognitive astonishment aroused led to all great scientific discoveries. So how might all this be harnessed for what I called in the title of this talk, new pedagogical opportunities in art history? Since I was first awarded that grant in 2019, I have taken some 16,000 photographs in 40 museums and galleries around the world. I haven't been able to apply for more grants to fund the project, but I kept it up whenever I could. If I visited a new city to attend a conference or to conduct research, I went to museums and I photographed works I could imagine someday maybe teaching. The sheer volume of digital files began to make it difficult to utilize the photographs. They were all originally unlabeled and looked like this, just arranged into folders by museum. But a few students, a few very generous students volunteered to begin helping me label the files, transforming them by artist, name, title, date, etc., so they could be more easily searched and accessed. In the process, 
I began to dream of creating a repository. And I'm showing you now a mock-up of how such a digital space might look. It would be a website where all of the photographs might be freely searched, much like museum websites. And it would be geared towards scholars, students, and those who just wanna look at art, but cannot. An actuality that became very real to all of us once Corona forced museums to close. My ultimate goal is to create a website that is freely accessible to anyone, similar to projects like Smart History, but where anyone with a phone, tablet, or computer could not only view the photographs, but contribute their own and download the images for teaching and learning purposes. This would make the site distinctive from repositories that already exist, such as Pinterest, Instagram, or the Google Art Project, none of which easily allow direct downloading of images. In a dream world, these detailed photographs would also be available for scholarly publishing, free of the usual hefty reproduction costs, something you can see I did in my own book just this past year. But I haven't consulted a copyright specialist to determine if I could do this on a large scale without incurring the wrath of the museums where I took the pictures. In the end, I imagine we would all agree that the art of the past no longer exists as it once did. Technology has brought it closer to us and the pandemic is forcing everyone to embrace new media platforms and reimagine the pedagogical techniques in our field. We are now faced with a choice as to what we want to do with all that technology has put at our fingertips. I will keep accumulating my detailed photographs and I will apply for grants to make my image repository a reality in the hope that others will also use my images to teach a new generation the patience that looking at them really requires. In so doing, my hope is that a new generation will find themselves astounded by art in the way I was when all we had was the Kodak carousel and its quiet glowing hum. Thank you.